Today we'll look at trauma-informed ways to interact with clients. Lori Markoff will serve as counselor for the scenarios, and the clients will be played by actors. After they're finished, we'll review each one. Let's begin by looking at trauma-informed core competencies and how they affect how practitioners work with their clients. Using an empowerment approach is the first competency. It's important to remember the experience of trauma is one of helplessness. A focus on trauma-informed work supports the client in regaining a sense of control. With the empowerment approach, practitioners help the client identify the choices they have and walk them through the outcomes of those choices. Practitioners do not tell the client what to do. Instead, they offer as much choice and control as possible. It's also important to focus on strengths with this approach, not deficits. Trauma-informed practitioners help clients recognize strengths that have helped them to survive to this point in time. They also point out every choice a client makes that show their ability and capacity to achieve their goals. Knowledge is power and practitioners educate clients about the relationship between past trauma and the current difficulties they're facing. Practitioners are transparent and make an effort to explain why they are doing what they do. When a client does not have control of the situation, it's important to provide information to help the client predict what is going to happen. Being able to predict is the next best thing to having control. It's critical for trauma-informed practitioners to build a safe relationship with their client. In most cases, clients have been victimized by people who claim to care about them. And because they've experienced few relationships that are equal, relationships without a winner or loser or perpetrator and victim, clients may not think it's possible to distinguish between safe and unsafe relationships. In fact, they may not even think relationships can be safe. When forming a safe relationship with a client, a collaborative approach is best. Practitioners should not position themselves as an expert. Instead, the client is the expert on their life experience, while the practitioner offers knowledge and experience. Together, they explore the client's life and consider the steps the client might take to move toward their goals. Asking questions can help establish this kind of relationship. Often clients feel providers do not listen to them. Practitioners should approach each person with an attitude of curiosity and openness. They should not make assumptions about a client's background, life, or past experiences. Being non-judgmental is important in building a safe relationship. Practitioners understand the choices the client makes are the best possible in the moment, and that the choice is about survival. Whether visible or not, it's important to remember the client carries a great deal of shame, and it's extremely important to be accepting without judgment. In gaining a client's trust, practitioners communicate as clearly as possible. Clients have experienced multiple betrayals and disappointments in the past, so providers need to go out of their way to be consistent between what they say and do. They also need to follow through on commitments and promises. Because clients feel they have not been seen, heard, or believed in the past, they often display extreme or difficult behaviors. Before discussing a behavior change, the practitioner validates feelings and checks out their understanding of the feelings with the client. This is part of building a safe relationship and also helps the client to develop their own emotional self-awareness. Practitioners are always aware of their own feelings while also understanding the client's hypersensitivity to the response of others. The practitioner must use their own self-regulation skills and model these skills with the client. When understanding or explaining a client's current behavior, practitioners must realize that oftentimes the present behavior is an attempt to cope with past trauma or its impact. Instead of judging, the practitioner skillfully asks questions to increase understanding, helping the client to connect current behavior with adverse past events. This helps the client to see that current behaviors that appear to be self-defeating were developed as attempts to survive adverse events and their impact. Trauma-informed practitioners understand that when a person is in flight, fight, or freeze mode, the part of the brain that thinks may not be available. 
Therefore, a person in flight, fight, or freeze may find it difficult to make healthy choices for safety. Even if they know in their mind that the feelings are irrational, their body reacts as if there is imminent danger, and there is a strong urge to react immediately in a way that has protected the person in the past. The practitioner helps the client maintain their emotional arousal at a level where they can think. And eventually, the client's task is to learn to do this for themselves. Learning to modulate feelings and make choices by thinking requires several skills, like being aware of feelings, knowing when they are in fight or flight, and learning to pause until they are more calm and then making a safe choice. A trauma-informed practitioner is aware of cues that a person is becoming dysregulated and helps the person to identify triggers that lead to this. Practitioners also help clients understand the strategies they can use to return to a more regulated state and can model them. These core competencies provide a solid foundation for a trauma-informed practitioner to build a strong, open, trusting relationship with their clients that supports growth. So one of the things that we know is that sometimes people who have difficulty with anxiety and things like that have also had some bad experiences in their lives. So I'm going to ask you some questions about some of your difficult experiences that you may have had. And um, I'm, going to, I'm just going to ask sort of yes or no questions. I only need sort of headlines. I don't need a lot of detail about the things that happened right now. But I'm just going to ask you those questions. And if anything about this interview starts to make you uncomfortable, you can take a break. If I ask a question you don't want to answer, you can um, just say pass, and I'll just move on. Um, so it's really up to you what you share, but I do want to ask you these questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So have you ever been physically hurt by anyone, any, um, either as a child or an adult, you know, hit? Um, um, yeah. my. Um I had a boyfriend a couple of years ago, and he um, he would hit me sometimes. Mm -hmm. But we're not together anymore, so. Mm -hmm. Was was there other kinds of physical abuse? You know, did he do more than than hit you? Was th was there anything? No, he would just slap me sometimes. Usually, when he was um, like, if he'd had a really hard day at work. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe he would be drinking or something. He mm -hmm. would slap me when he got home, but I got out of that, so that's good. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good that you recognize that that was um, really not acceptable behavior yeah. and, and that you didn't want that in your relationship, and it's great that you were able to get away from that. Mm -hmm. um, that's really good self-care, that you were able to make that decision and, you know, and make a different choice and create more safety for yourself. That's really good. Thanks. What about sexually? Has anybody ever, um, you know, when you were a child or as an adult, um, touched you against your will? Um, anything like that? Um, yeah. I don't really want to talk about it though, but yeah, okay. when I was when I was little. How little? Just vaguely. Like 10, I okay. think. Okay. And was it a family member or a stranger or? It was, it was a family member, but I don't really like talking about it. Okay. So. You don't have to. Okay. Great. Thank you for telling me that much. That's really all I need okay. for right now. Although it may be important for you to talk about that later at some point, you can wait until you're ready. Okay. Okay. As a child, you know, f sometimes parents aren't very available, don't provide basic food, clothing, shelter, that kind of thing. Did you ever have that experience of being neglected? Hmm. What's going on, Trisha? I 
don't like all these questions. Yeah, starting to get uncomfortable, huh? You feel that somewhere in your body? You're feeling that in your body? Yeah. Sometimes these questions can bring up very difficult things. I know. Sorry. When you're feeling like this, what helps you? My cat. Hmm. Tell me about your cat. She's a jerk. <laughs> She's a jerk? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's not very friendly. Um... She's friendly to me, though. When I'm really upset, she, uh, she'll, like, cuddle with me on the bed and stuff. So she knows when I'm really upset, but, um. It's great that she knows Yeah. That. That's pretty amazing, <laughs> she's actually. She's kind of, she's just kind of a jerk. She'll, she'll bite and scratch at whoever she wants to. And she wants to be snuggled until she doesn't want to be snuggled, so. What's her name? Persephone. Persephone. That's a great name for a cat. She came with it, and I decided to just leave it. Wow, I like yeah. it a lot. Great, it's wonderful to have a cat named Persephone who's good at um, helping you when your feelings are difficult. That's really good. That's, that's, you know, that's a blessing there. Can we go on with the interview now? Yeah, I guess. Is it okay yeah. about continuing? Okay, I'm gonna ask you some um, different questions. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about your living situation. So, um, what kind of housing do you live in? I have an apartment. Mm -hmm. And how long have you lived there? Um, almost a year. Uh -huh, so not that long. No. And who do you live with? Just the cat. Just for a second. <laughs> okay. Um, do you feel safe where you live? safer than when I was homeless. Mm -hmm. Safer, um, but maybe not entirely safe? Yeah. Yeah. What makes you not feel that safe where you live? I have kind of a... I have a landlord situation. Mm -hmm. a difficult relationship with your landlord? You could, you could say that. Can you tell me about it? <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't make a lot of money and my hours got cut at work recently and um, he said he was gonna evict me and I really didn't want to be homeless again. So. <sighs> he said if I had sex with him that uh, I wouldn't have to pay my rent. sense. So you agreed to that? Well, I didn't want to be homeless again. That's right. And in order to survive, anyone is going to do what they have to do, right? But it sounds like... That's what I keep telling myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's also upsetting you a lot. I just keep thinking, like, what if somebody finds out? And now I told you, so obviously people are going to find out. <laughs> well, what do you mean, people? Well, I mean, don't you have to tell people when stuff like that happens? No, actually, what you and I discuss is between us um, and um, you you'll get to decide what you want to do about that situation. 
so we can talk about it, but you get to decide. Um, I only have to disclose if you're going to kill yourself or someone else um, to somebody else. Those are, you know, or if you're abusing an elder. Those are the circumstances under which I have to let other people know. Um, okay. So this is something that's just for you and I to talk about. Um, and as part of, you know, our work together, we can decide what's the best way to take care of yourself going forward. So it's entirely up to you what we do from, from here. Um, and I totally appreciate the courage it took to let me know that that was happening. And um, I'm happy to be with you as you sort out what's really the best path for you going forward for your own well-being. Um, we'll work on that together. Does that make sense to you? Kind of. I no, one, no one's ever said it to me like that before, so I thought you had to tell people, but no. if not, that No. You know. And I should tell you that, remember how I said earlier in the interview that people who've had ex adverse experiences like sexual abuse in their past or physical abuse in their past, that sometimes that's connected to what happens going forward? Yeah. Well, it's not, it's really common for girls who've experienced sexual abuse later in life to end up using or being in a position where they end up um, using that for survival purposes. So what you're experiencing is actually probably a lot more common than you think. But just like, like you didn't want to talk about it, you know, the reason you don't know that other people are doing that is because they don't often talk about it. So that way you think you're the only one in the world who ever ended up in this position, and, you know. But in reality, lots of girls who've experienced sexual abuse grow up, and it changes, you know, something that then, um, you know, they end up putting themselves, you know, they end up in situations. Now, obviously, you didn't create this situation, right? Your landlord is the one who um, is proposing to use his position of power to get you to do something that isn't what you want to do. And you're not responsible for his doing that. You're not. Um, you're, you're just doing what you've learned to do to help you survive. And we can work together for you to figure out what other options you have and what else you can do. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. Thanks. Thanks for being so open. So are you ready to continue with the rest of the interview? Yeah. Yeah. You're doing a really good job. A really good job. A lot Thanks. of hard stuff and you're, and you're letting me in and that'll help us to be able to you know, um, figure out together what you need to do to, you know, help with your anxiety and to make your life work better for you. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to ask you some questions about your... So we've come to the end of all the questions, and thanks for hanging in with me. I know it was a lot of questions, but I feel like, you know, I've gotten to know you a lot by asking these questions, so actually you've done a really good job of helping me to sort of begin to piece together the puzzle of what we're going to work on together. So that's really good. Um, so now that the interview is over, the next step will be um, we'll make an appointment before you go, you know, for you to come back. Um, but I just want to ask you now, how, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Um, well, I'm not shaking anymore, so <laughs> that's good. Um, I, I think I'll be okay. All right. Um, so if yeah. after this interview um, you go about your life and you start to have difficult feelings, what are some things that you already know that you can do to help yourself with those feelings? Well, I, I play the guitar, so um, I think sometimes that helps a little bit and, you know, and then there's Persephone. The, the mean cat, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh-huh. Yeah. And is there anyone in your life that you could call if you were having a hard time? Yeah, um, actually my 
my best friend she knows about all my anxiety and everything so sometimes I'll call her and just say hey I really need to not you know be here or whatever and she lets me come over so that's great so you have some ways to take care of yourself I just want to make sure that yeah. the stuff we opened up in this interview doesn't end up interfering too much in your regular life so thanks very much Trisha and I'll see you next okay. week thank you take care This scenario illustrates an example of a trauma-informed intake or initial assessment. It's really important before beginning to ask questions about trauma to explain to the client exactly why you're doing that. And that also begins the psychoeducation about the connection between trauma and the kinds of problems that people have. You also want to give the client real control over what she shares. And there are a lot of things that I do to help that to happen. I tell her that she can refuse to answer or she can take a break. And when I do that, some clinicians will say, oh no, if I do that, then I'll never get through the intake in time. The thing is, if you're doing a trauma-informed assessment, it's really more important to create a safe relationship than it is to meet your deadlines. And also, even though I offer people the opportunity to take a break, they almost never do because they want to get through the session as much as you do. Notice that we ask short answer questions, looking for headlines and not pressing for details. Again, we don't need that information and that information might be dysregulating to the client. In this interview, when Trisha begins to share her experience with domestic violence, I maintain the non-judgmental kind of approach and point out her strength in leaving that relationship rather than focusing her on the difficulty of being in that relationship in the first place. That also helps with re-regulation. Eventually, the interview does create some dysregulation for Trisha, and it is important that I notice that and acknowledge it, and then that I help her to re-regulate. And the way that I do that is by focusing her on what she can do about it, what she normally does to self-soothe when things are difficult. And of course, that's good information for me to help to have, and also it gives her some um, idea of what we can do together that will help her moving forward. In a real trauma-informed agency, we would have gone over the rules of confidentiality before I ever asked Trisha a, sin a single question. In this role play, I wasn't expecting that issue to come up. And therefore, when I gave her the information about confidentiality, I left out some of the exceptions to confidentiality. In a real situation, it is important, even if the client has already heard them, to mention all of the exceptions so that there's never a sense of distrust because something has to be shared that she wasn't aware of. At the conclusion of an interview like this, it's really important to take the client back and check in and make sure how she's feeling at the end of the interview. And even if the client says that she's feeling okay, it's a good idea to create a safety plan for going forward about what she's gonna do should feelings develop that are difficult afterwards. So Karima, um, I'm Lori, and I'm gonna be your counselor while you're here. Okay. It's nice to meet you. I'm you glad too. you're here. I heard you had a hard time last night. Do you want to no. tell me about it? Um, you know, I, they was eating dinner when I got there, so I went in to put my stuff up, and you know, they I guess they put the place on the table and stuff, so I separated my stuff like I normally do on my plate, and then went back to put my stuff up, and by the time I came back, I swear somebody had messed with my food. I know they had because it was like all, oh, you know, jumbled up and stuff was touching and I just, oh, yeah, I was, I was so upset. All I could think about was how I had to eat that dog food. So I didn't even want it. I just threw it in the trash. So eating the dog food, that, well, that was a memory for you? Mm -hmm. Something that happened to you before? Yeah, I had to do it. Yeah. 
And that sounds really hard. What kinds of feelings did that bring up for you? Oh, just, just sad and like, you know, it's just like a, I feel like an animal. Mm-hmm. Right. And so then when somebody messes with your food, it reminds you of that. And those feelings yeah. sound pretty hard, really hard. And so yeah. how did you manage those feelings? What did you do? Well, I tried to just, you know, I didn't want to say nothing to nobody because this is like my sixth group home. I don't even know how many they have here, but I like it here. You know, I don't want to have to leave again. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to make sure that I have a place to stay, but, you You were know, worried I, about being kicked out. That's scary, too. Yeah. Yeah. I had yeah. just got there, so, so I knew not to, you know, not, I had just got there, so I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to start no trouble, so I had to do what I had to do. So you felt like you had to handle this on your own, mm -hmm. that, that it wasn't a good idea to let people help you. Yeah. I'm not trusting people there. I just got there. Mm -hmm. It's like I wasn't even paying attention. I just looked up when I got in the room, I still had the fork in my hand. Mm -hmm. So right. So you don't even remember making that decision. It just kind of, yeah, just, there you were with the fork. I had to do something because I just wanted to just knock something over and just flip something over. Just, I yeah. really wanted to put my hands on somebody, but. You felt pretty overwhelmed. So. And so you, you were, you actually like made the choice that this might be the safest thing you could do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it, it felt better. like it was a better choice than you might hurt somebody, you might knock something over. So you actually thought about that and, and I mean, that's pretty impressive. It's impressive that you were able to think of the things you didn't want to do and make a different choice. That's pretty impressive. That shows a lot of strength. Thank you. Really. So after you cut, after you used the fork, mm -hmm. did that help you? Did it? Did you feel better? Well, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I didn't have to, you know, I didn't still want to hurt somebody else. And, uh -huh. you know, it kind of took my mind off of all that. And, you know, so I could, so I could stay here. So I didn't just get up and leave again like I uh -huh. did the other places, you know. So all those overwhelming feelings, all those things you didn't want to do. You didn't want to hurt somebody. You didn't want to knock the furniture around. Right. You didn't want to get up and leave. And so the alternative you could think of that would help you deal with the feelings was to use the fork to yep. scratch yourself. Yeah, that's pretty amazing that you could make that choice, that you thought about what your best options were and you chose that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that shows a lot of strength. So are there any like negative things about using that, cutting yourself? What, what, what's the downside of that? Is there any downside? Well, normally, like after, you know, after it's over, um, a lot of times I have to, you know, until they heal, I have to wear like long sleeves and and stuff like that because I don't want people asking me, you know, what's that? What happened right there? You know, all of that stuff. So I just, you know, normally mm -hmm. I just keep it bandaged up and, mm -hmm. and you know, I try and just keep this covered and it's kind of uncomfortable in the summertime because it's hot, mm -hmm. you know, but. Right, so you have to hide it. Mm -hmm. If somebody does notice and ask you about it, what, what's that feeling? What do you feel when somebody notices? Do you know? I feel ashamed and, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know, sometimes embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Why would you be embarrassed? Well, because, you know, I, I know that everybody doesn't do that, you know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, you know, it's been something all my life, but, you know, I see people with tattoos or braces and stuff like that, and they don't have all that stuff and scars and stuff on their arms, so, mm -hmm. you know. Sometimes I wonder, you know, how how's that going to look, you know, later in life on my arms, or, you know, will I ever stop that, and, you know, how am I going to wear short sleeve shirts, and, you know, when it heals up, I know, I mean, I know I'm, I'm black, but right. So you but it's not gonna just like disappear. So right. 
So you don't really like having scars, mm -hmm. and you don't really like people knowing that this is what you're doing. So those are the downsides. That that those are the reasons why you might not really like doing this. And it sounds like you wonder if you're going to need to do it forever. Yeah. So first, first I want to say again that it's amazing what you're able to tell me. I mean, I just want to tell you, not every kid I talk to can even say, I feel shame, can even name their feelings. So another thing, it seems like you're really aware of your feelings and you know how to name them. And it also sounds like you really think about what you do. So given all that, if we together could come up with other things you could do instead of cutting, maybe you would be willing to try them? Yeah. So have you ever successfully resisted an urge like that? Have you ever done anything else that worked? Ever in your life, even one time? No. I mean, you know, when I when I do stuff to other people, okay, I don't do stuff to myself. So. so hurting other people was was another thing. But you've always either hurt someone else or hurt yourself in these kinds of situations, as far as you can remember. Yeah. So messing with your food—that's one trigger for oh, you. Oh yes, yes. Do yes. you know what the others are? Like, what are the other kinds of things that people might do that? bring up really difficult feelings for you? Um, when people say mean stuff like, um, why do you look like that? Or, you know, why do you have that? Why you always got on long sleeves? And, you know, or, or they say like, why are you always wearing all those bracelets? Or, you know, or just when, you know, when they question me about stuff like that and I really don't want them out of my business like that. It's just so sometimes you feel a little like people are too much in your business, and, yeah. and that's another trigger, people being sort of, I don't know, pushing themselves into your business. Yeah. That, that's a, another kind of trigger. So now we know, too, messing with your food and getting in your business. So do you think that there's a connection between the bad things that have happened to you and you're cunning, do you think? I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's not, a, it's not uncommon, actually, for kids who've been hurt to end up finding ways to cope with the feelings of being hurt. And one pretty common way is to hurt themselves. You know, so, so you're not the first person who said to me, I do this when I'm feeling overwhelmed and then it makes me feel better. Like, that's not an uncommon experience. And it's a particularly common thing for, for people who've been hurt when they were younger. That's a common kind of thing. And so, um, you're not the only one. And how we like to work with people here is we want to help you learn what are the triggers for your urge to do that? So know what they are, just know them so that when it happens, you're not surprised. And then what we want to help you do is try other things before you cut. So try other things and see if they'll help you with those feelings, okay. you know? and and. You and I will talk again about what those different things might be, some things I might teach you how to, you know, to do and to try others. I'm going to try to help you find. Um, you know, so you might want to think about any time you ever resisted the urge and what helped. You don't have to talk about that right now because okay. we're going to, we don't have that much more time today. But, but I want you to start when you can and when you feel calm thinking, well, did I ever resist the urge and what did I do? And, and maybe making a list of the things that make you feel good. So thank you, Karima. You did a really good job with this. I really appreciate how much you were able to share with me.
really do. Thanks. Thank you. This scenario illustrates a trauma-informed approach to the use of self-injury. My initial focus in this interview is to validate and understand Karima's experience of the event. So I ask her a lot about her feelings, a lot about the sequence of events and what her experience was at the time. I use my own self-regulation skills in order to do this so that she isn't triggered by my response to what she's been doing. As she herself mentions the memory of the dog food, I take that opportunity to connect her memories and her past experience with her use of the self-injury. What she's able to teach me about is that self-injury in this case is an effective strategy that she has used to manage difficult feelings. When she says that she's unable to trust the staff in the program, I'm very careful not to challenge that because it's actually a pretty reasonable um, statement from her given that she just met these people. And that's a way of joining with her and helping her to see that I truly understand her experience. Once I'm certain that I have validated her feelings and that she's um, explained the event to me and she feels heard and understood, then I do a probe to see whether she has any ambivalence about the use of this coping strategy. What I'm looking for here is what stage of change she's in because I don't want to jump ahead of her and begin to talk about changing the behavior if she herself doesn't have any ambivalence. However, it's very clear that she does, and then I'm e able to demonstrate with her and kind of lay out a plan for us going forward about how we can work together to eventually help her to find other behaviors. So we talk about her triggers. I try asking about the coping strategies that she currently uses, and when I don't get any, I go back to the triggers and tell her that maybe going forward I'll be able to teach her some strategies, or maybe she'll be able to think of some. One person viewing this video objected to the fact that I used the word kid, and it's possible that that could have been heard as disrespectful. It is important to pay attention to the language you use and to use the client's own language as much as possible. But if you make a mistake and use a word that they react to, then it's important to, you know, to apologize for that backup and then begin to use the language again that's comfortable for them. Hey Steve, how you doing today? I'm doing I'm doing good. A lot better now. Mm-hmm. Better? Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I almost didn't make it this time. Yeah. I, I've been messing with the, the, this alcohol too long. I gotta get my act together. Yeah, that was a really scary episode you had before you came in here, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you almost died. Yeah. How confident are you that you're going to be able to um, stay sober when you get out? Well, I, I, I better. I better stay sober this time because it's, it just it just keeps getting worse. I keep thinking I'm going to I can't toy with it anymore. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have to I'm going to take care take take advantage of supports and I'll do good this time. Mm -hmm. So what where are you going to be living when you leave? I'm uh I'm hoping to go back with a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. That I've been uh living with for off and on for uh, quite some time and uh we uh She's, uh, she's, she thinks I'm gonna, she believes me that I'm gonna do better this time. She's gonna give me one more chance. Mm -hmm. So she supports your she does. recovery. Yeah, mm -hmm. and she's gonna, she's uh, expecting me to do things that I've been avoiding, like going to uh, NA and, or AA and uh, getting counseling and going to church. So I'm gonna do all, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. gonna, so you're gonna make use of supports? I am, uh -huh. yeah, I'm gonna do it this time. The last time that you were here, um, did you not make use of supports? No. Well, I, I tried for a bit, but then you know, I didn't like it, and so I took off. And you know, I didn't really stick with it very long. That long. I'm gonna try to stick with it this time. Mm -hmm. And what didn't you like about? Well, I don't like uh, people going on and on about their stories. It just makes me want to use. So, yeah, that kind of thing. So I. 
So I, I guess I was focusing on that part of it, and it seems like it's just better if I just decide not to do it, but then I do keep going back and getting hooked on it again, so. So yeah, so that, but uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm gonna have to try to try to try to, to stick with meetings. That's probably my best bet, even though I'm not crazy about them. Well, wait, so you're saying that when you went to meetings, it didn't help you? Well, no, not really. Mm -hmm. And that actually going to meetings made you want to use more? Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know, you know any, what else could I do? other than meetings, that's what everybody says, go to meetings, so. How, is there anything that you've ever done that you think did help you to stay sober? Um, well, I used to be much more into staying fit and exercising, and um, you know, I kind of let a lot of that go, I wasn't taking care of myself. So I, you know, getting a good routine for staying healthy, probably should go back to church get some good morals, stay away from bad crowd, stay away from the party scene. Mm -hmm. Has church helped you in the past? It has. It's, I've, had, I've had good periods with it, but then I get mad because people seem judgmental a lot of the time and, and they just, uh, I, sometimes I feel like I can't really relate too much to, to people at church. Um, but you know, it, it, you know, if every, I meet somebody every now and then. I've met, been at churches where I meet maybe a couple cool people, and and uh, I always seem to kind of get disappointed or disillusioned or something, or anger always seems to creep in there at some point. Mm -hmm. And is anger one of the precipitants for your using? Yeah. Your drinking? Yeah. Yeah. So if you get angry. Yeah, probably an ang yeah yeah I, I probably should definitely do an anger support group of some kind. Would you like? Do you think that would help? Yeah, that would probably help. I've never really done anything, done that. Okay. But yeah. So it sounds like, you know, you would like to have on your plan an anger support group. Um, maybe we could help you find one and make a referral before you go if yeah. you want. Okay. Um, sounds like you want to go back to church. Yeah. Um, any other supports you think you, you? Well, my girlfriend can be a good support, you know, as long as she doesn't get to nagging me, stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. That always gets me. She can uh, start, you know, watching me like a hawk, and then I get irritated and, and uh, you know, start kind of trying to control my every move. Hopefully it doesn't go that way. Mm. So it sounds like sometimes that relationship is good, and but that there are moments in it where you get angry, and does that lead back to your drinking again? Yeah, yeah, it is a hard relationship. I mean, she... Uh, she can be supportive, but then she can be really controlling too at the same time. So when she gets like that, then I, then I tend to just just say screw it, you know, and try to tune out. So yeah, it can be a it, that that relationship can be a problem. So it is it's a bit of a risk, but at the same time, when it's good, it's good. So I'm hoping, you know, I won't get into that negative pattern again. So on a scale of zero to ten, with zero being um, you're absolutely certain you're going to relapse, and ten being you're absolutely certain that you'll you're not going to drink again. Mm -hmm. With that plan, going home to live with your girlfriend, maybe going to an anger management group and going to church. Um, with that plan, how confident are you that you'll be able to stay sober? Zero yeah, to yeah. I, um, well, you know, my track record isn't good, but I. I, I uh, you know, it's, 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 I think, I think, I, I don't know. Can you put a number on it? Zero to ten. Okay, now. let's, let's say, let's say 50-50, five. Okay. Realistically. So, so that's, okay. I mean, I, I know I'll do good for a while, but, you know, it just seems like something always comes and gets, gets me and then I just get back into the negative thinking and. Mm -hmm. drinking and then it keeps getting worse and you know it's hard to say with my track record that I won't go back but I'm certainly going to try not to. Mm -hmm. So can you think of any other possibilities of where you could go after you left here that might be better? I'm asking whether you would consider maybe going to some more treatment. Um, something like um, a residential 
treatment program where you could live there and there would be you know group supports right available to you well yeah I mean I'd be willing to do that if I you know I'm gonna I'm gonna try all these supports that you're suggesting and and I would say you know if you know, it's not gonna be long until my girlfriend you know she's not gonna put up with any anything so I'd be willing to do that if, it, if I start to slip but I'd like to have one more shot to do it right this time do all the things I'm being told to do so I'm a little worried about 50 percent so you almost died. Now you're, like, but, now you're just sounding like my girlfriend. You know, this is, what, what is this? You know, come on. What, what am I saying that sounds like your girlfriend? You know, just nag, 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 you know. I mean, you just, you know, you're just saying, give me easy answers. And you're just saying, just look at the positive side and just tell me what you want, you know, what, what, what I want to hear. So, you know, mm. it's, you know, it's just, you just want, to, want me to tell you what you want to hear. I'll just be honest with you, you know, 50-50, you know. No, I really do appreciate your honesty. I really do want you to be honest. And, and I hear that it's a little bit frustrating for you to have somebody sort of pushing at you a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Well, you just seem like, you know, you're just trying to get me to go to another program, you know. And, and I, 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 like I told you, I haven't had luck, luck with programs, you know. I don't, you know, I don't think half the workers that are in these programs even want to be there. They all seem burned out to me. They go off and sit in the office and just leave us to sit here and stew and, in a room. And you know, you just want to seem to seem to want to push me into that kind of thing. You know, and mm -hmm. I, I just I don't, I, I don't. Yeah, it feels I, to you like I'm pushing. It does. Yeah. yeah so. Okay, so I want you to know that it's entirely up to you what you do. Well, <laughs> what are you going to do? Cab me over there? No. Um, so. You know, what I was thinking of is you and I can go over to the program and you can, I'll go with you, we can meet the staff, you can hear what, about what it's like, and then we can have another conversation like this. And I want you to know that it is totally up to you what you do. I just you, would you're like... You're saying you're going to go with me? Yeah, I'll go with you. Baloney. You're not going to go with me. I'm going to go with you. I absolutely mean that. We're going to call the program and find out what time is good, and then I will go over there with you and we will look at the program together. And then we'll talk about the pros and cons again. Hmm. You know, I'm, I'm concerned that 50-50 isn't enough chance, but you have the right to take that risk. It is your life. You have the right to take that risk. What I'm suggesting is before you take that risk, you explore another alternative in a little bit more depth and see, you know, I'm going to show you a, very, a specific program, one that I think is really good. You may not, and that's okay. I still can choose. But you, yeah, absolutely you'll get to choose. I absolutely promise that it is up to you what you do. I would just like to have, for you to give yourself the opportunity. And you really know, you know this program, you know people in the program. Yeah, what, I do. How do you know I it's do. a good program? What well, I refer, I've referred other clients, many of whom are now in recovery. I know the staff over there. So it's a program I know a lot about. And they've had some really good success with people who seem similar to you, people who've, you know, with alcohol problems, who've relapsed a number of times. Um, they've had some really good success. And, you know, from my point of view, at least it would be good if you looked at it and thought about it. And you know what? If in the end you decide not to do it right now, you know, before you said, you know, maybe if you went with your girlfriend and you failed again that you would be willing to go to a program. So even if you don't go now, then at least you would know what that program was like. And so if you got to a place where you were ready to go, you would at least have a program that you know about to go to rather than, you know, get into that you know, relapse place and not even know where you could call. So well, this is the first time somebody's offered to actually go and show me a program. So I don't could promise anything, but I'll, yeah, sh show me your program. You know, okay. I'll go. Great. I'm going to call them and see if I can get us a time to go over. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, Steve. I, I have a lot of respect for you. I realize that you, it's really important to you that you get to make your own choices, and I want you to be able to make your own choices. And, you know, so I totally appreciate your being willing to at least look at another option. Okay. Okay. This scenario demonstrates trauma-informed discharge planning. 
notice that instead of telling Steve what his discharge plan should be, I explored with him his own confidence in his ability to retain his sobriety and connected that to different supports that he thought might support him in being able to do that. The plan for this role play was that Steve was supposed to get angry and then I was supposed to handle that. It was difficult when we were actually doing it for him to get angry because there wasn't much to push against. However, I was able to, with some coaching, get him to do that. When he did become angry, then I used my own self-regulation skills and explored with him what the anger was about, and that seemed to help him to settle and to be able to move on. In moving forward, realizing that disempowerment was a lot what he was concerned about, I was able to um, emphasize repeatedly his power of choice and that I wasn't going to make him do anything he didn't want to do. Often clients in discussing their discharge plans will simply comply with what the provider says and then they'll fail to follow through. It's more effective to help the client to explore their ambivalence so that they're aware of both the pros and cons of what they're deciding. In that way, when they finally get to a decision, they're more aligned with it and able to follow through. In watching this video, there was some concern on the part of some providers that my offering to take Steve to the program was enabling. However, this is what we call making a robust referral. Steve is a trauma survivor and he has difficulty with trust and he may also have difficulty walking into a situation when he doesn't know what to expect. So I use the safety of our relationship to help him to make the transfer to another program, using that safety to make a bridge between my approach with him and the program that I'm taking him to. In this way, I think it's more likely that once he's seen the program, he'll have a little bit more comfort and consider the possibility of enrolling in that program. So this video has illustrated what it's like to work with clients in a trauma-informed way. We're assuming when we make this video that your organization already uses a trauma-informed approach and has tailored its um, policies and procedures to using trauma-informed approaches. In that way, the, the, the person's experience of the entire organization will reinforce the trauma-informed approach that we use in the interactions with clients.